right now that this next hour is for him and for him alone whatever he desires whatever his heart for you is that you would receive in the same way the blessed mother in her humility and love and trust received the Holy Spirit knowing that it was risky not knowing how she would explain how she could be an unwed, pregnant teenager. Not knowing how God would be providing for this new life that would be formed in her. Not knowing what it would mean to become the mother of God. She said yes. Holy Spirit, lead us to Mary level trust us to Mary level openness and surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, we give you permission. Jesus, we trust in you. Come Lord God, be with us now. In all things, we trust you Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your death on the cross. Thank you for choosing us and calling us out of darkness. Thank you for desiring to put your very life into our soul. We open our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. I would rather be no place I would rather be than here in your love here in your love no place I would rather be no place I would rather be there's no place I would rather be than here in your love here in your love so send a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. Sing it out. I want more of you. Set a fire. And set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. No place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your love. There's no place I would rather be, Lord. There's no place I would rather be. No Holy Spirit. No place I would rather be. Here in your love, here in your love. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. You give us more of you, more of you, Lord. We need more of you. Thank you, Jesus. Use your voice. Use the, 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 the desire of your heart. Speak it out. Do not be ashamed. Just sing your praise to God. It says in the song, Lord, I want to sing a new song to the Lord. Right now, sing a song you've never sung before. The spontaneous praise that's in your heart. Just let it out to God. Let's just sing to the Lord, for he delights and inhabits our praise. And he wants to come very near to each one of us right now. So let us just sing. Come, Holy Spirit. And if you don't know what else to sing, just sing, I love you, Jesus. Some people live their whole lives without saying, I love you, Jesus, and meaning it. And if you mean it, then sing it out right now. Don't miss the opportunity to tell the Lord that you love him. 
I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love your precious name, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Send forth your spirit, Lord. I love you, Jesus. so close to us and doing just wanting to work so powerfully we just give you these next few minutes as precious as they are lord we want them to be for your glory and for your purpose and for for your will so we just surrender this time to you we make you the lord of this time you are the lord jesus christ have your way in us do what you will god we accept all we trust in you we believe that you will nothing but our good we trust in you jesus Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. I'm going to say about a third of what I thought I was going to say, and then we're just going to get back to that. Because if you hear God say three words to you in prayer this afternoon, they're going to be worth more than 3,000 words that I could sputter out here. So I'm just going to be a warm-up act for the Holy Spirit. How's that? <laughs> you know, is anyone from Chicago? A couple of people from Chicago. You're from Rockford. Close enough. We'll let it count. I've been to John Paul's house. He's got an amazing family. Just, he's, he's a great guy. 1871. You know what happened in 1871? The Great Chicago Fire. Destroyed much of the city. They actually, you know, if you, if people who know Chicago, you know, like there's, the, they call it the Gold Coast, right? There's the river that goes down, and there's like this whole strip of land that's between Lake Michigan and the Chicago River. And at one time, that river flowed down from the north through Chicago, then emptied into Lake Michigan. That's a fact. It doesn't do that anymore. Because what happened is, Chicago, as Chicago was being developed as a city, all these slaughterhouses and all the human waste from the city of Chicago was dumped into the Chicago River. I went online, I saw pictures of like small animals walking on the surface of the river because it had thickened into a sludge of dead animal and human waste. They called it King River. <laughs> and it was actually combustible. When the F Chicago fire started, the river caught on fire and that's what allowed the fire to spread from the one part of the city of Chicago over to the next. That's how disgusting it was. And it wasn't just that it was flammable. <laughs> In, 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 in one year, in one year, 10,000 people died of cholera and typhoid in the city of Chicago because it was so polluted and so nasty. And they knew that the future of the city of Chicago depended on fixing this problem. There was no way that life would flourish around such a contaminated and polluted river. And so the engineers got together and they came up with a scheme. We're going to reverse the flow of the Chicago River. Nothing like this in the world of engineering had been attempted before. And so by building a series of canals and locks where the water would flow, the filthy water, and it was contaminating Lake Michigan, this water that was flowing out, the sludge that was coming out of the Chicago River into, the, into Lake Michigan was polluting the lake, killing the fish and, and, and making the beaches disgusting. That was now going to be the source of the river. And this was not an easy task. It took years and years. 
But they had to deal with the fact that over 14 years between the Chicago fire and 1890, 100,000 people had now died of typhoid and cholera and other diseases because of the Chicago River. So they dug a 28-mile long canal, and it used to be uh, the, the river would come down and flow into Lake Michigan, but now the fresh water was flowing in from Lake Michigan, and it was entering this canal and clearing out the Chicago River, and it went down, and it connects um, to the De Plain, Des Plaines River, right? Is that pronounced correct? Des Plaines? Close enough? What do you, you don't know? You have no idea. You're clear. Yeah, 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 you're from Chicago. Very good. Uh, and then it flows into the Illinois River, and then it flows into the Mississippi River. And the clean water cleared out all the muck, all the disgusting sewage. They moved more rock and stone building that canal than they did building the Panama Canal. It's one of the most amazing engineering feats. And instead of this shallow, sluggish, brown, polluted, filthy, disgusting sludge, it was now flowing with fresh water. And they saved the city. They honestly believed that they would have had to abandon the area if they hadn't cleaned up the Chicago River. And this is the same principle that's at work in our life with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ loves us too much to leave our souls shallow, sluggish, sluggish, polluted with the stink of sin. sin. So he wants to reverse the flow and let a flow of fresh water into each one of our lives to clean it out, to restore it and renew it and let it be a source of life and not a source of death. That's what baptism in the Holy Spirit is. And when I first read this story, I started thinking about Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 6 through 9, where Ezekiel's taken by, uh, the, by the Lord. And it's the flow of river that's coming out of the temple. There's a water flowing out of the temple. I believe that this is so symbolic and for, 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 so foreshadowing of Pentecost, right? This water flowing out of the temple. And this is what, the, you know, is recorded in, in Ezekiel 47, 6 through 90. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back along the bank of the river. And he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into Arabah. And when it enters the stagnant waters of the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature which swarms will live. And there will be many fish for this, for this water goes there that the waters of the sea may become fresh. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is the experience that God has given each one of us to say yes to the grace of baptism and receive a fresh flow of his Holy Spirit in our life to renew us, to strengthen us, to wash away our sin, and to set us free to love him and to know him and to serve him with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's what baptism in the Holy Spirit is. It is a, an expansion, a renewal, a deepening of what we received when we were infants or when we entered the church. It's new life. And it's necessary if we've never said yes to this. I so much appreciated what Bishop Sam did last night in asking those who'd never given their hearts to Jesus Christ to do that. And for those who had to, to renew that commitment. Why? Because the, the greatest thing that we have, which is stronger than our emotions, which is stronger than our affections, which is stronger than anything, is our wills. We make decisions and things can happen. Even when we don't feel like making it happen, if we decide to do it, it happens. Our will is, dependent, is, is independent of our feelings. We can choose this. So even as you sit here, you might go, I don't even know if I really know it's going to happen. I don't even know what God might have for me if I say yes to the Holy Spirit. All I'm telling you is you can choose and step into that in faith and say, God, I open my heart to your Holy Spirit. And God will say yes. How do I know this? Because he says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and you shall open. It shall be opened up into you. And he says, look, if your fathers on earth who are sinful know how to give good gifts, how much more does the Holy Spirit, I mean, how much more does your heavenly Father know how to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God is desirous to give the Holy Spirit. And this is something that we find all throughout the scriptures. Jesus saying, I came to cast fire upon the earth, and would that it were already kindled. That's Luke, 24, I mean, Luke 12, 49. He wants us to be on fire with the Holy Spirit. 
He says in Acts chapter 1, before he ascends, he says, while meeting with them, he enjoined them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father about which you have heard me speak. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. St. John the 23rd said at the beginning of Vatican II, renew your wonders in our time as though through a new Pentecost. He saw the church needing a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. St. John Paul the Great writes, the institutional and charismatic aspects are co-essential, as it were, to the church's constitution. It is like having two lungs that need to be breathing. The institutional, sacramental church breathes grace into the life of the believer. But the charismatic lung, the other essential element that makes up the constitution of the church, needs to be active for the church to be healthy. You, you, you can't run this race of faith by breathing through one lung. You need both lungs to be active. And he goes on to say it is from this providential rediscovery and he's talking about charismatic renewal. It's a providential rediscovery of what? Of the church's charismatic dimension. It's been rediscovered. He looks at what happened with our old school charismatic brothers and sisters and said, what they did was not create something new, but they rediscovered a treasure that had been lost for years that was being renewed in our time. Because Why? Because St. John the 23rd prayed for it. This was an answer to prayer. One pope prayed for it, another pope ushered it in, and every pope since then has affirmed it. Pope Benedict XVI said, in effect, Jesus' whole mission, his whole mission was aimed at giving the Spirit of God to men and baptizing them in a bath of regeneration. And he said this on Pentecost 2008. Today I would like to extend this invitation to all. Let us rediscover, dear brothers and sisters, the beauty of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let us recover awareness of our baptism and our confirmation, ever timely sources of grace. So he's saying, like, look, baptism in the Holy Spirit, being baptized in the Holy Spirit takes you back to these sacraments and releases the grace that you received. And it does something new. It takes it further. It activates it. It makes it alive and real for us today. This is so essential. Pope Francis himself has said, the charismatic renewal, you have received a great gift from the Lord. Your movement's birth was willed by the Holy Spirit to be a current of grace in the church and for the church. So he sees those people who are, who are lined up and, and, and living the life in the Holy Spirit. And he says, look, you're a gift to the church. It was willed by the Holy Spirit that you be brought up because this current of grace is necessary for the church to thrive. And if there was ever a time of darkness when the light of the Holy Spirit and the grace that he brings needs to be just flooding us, it's now. We need to be revived, restored, renewed, redeemed, brought back to life by the same power, the same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the grave is at work in our lives and through us and our witness. He can bring the church back from the dead because let's face it, with only 20% of Catholics going to Mass on Sunday, the church is dying. We're not winning. But we have all that we need to win through the Holy Spirit. What is necessary is what... It's always been necessary. It was necessary for Mary. It was necess it's necessary for us. It was all the saints can testify to this. What's necessary is an unreserved, unlimited yes to the power of the Holy Spirit to do something amazing in our lives, even miraculous if he so chooses. Amen? Amen. So this baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's an experience that's given to the church to release and strengthen the effects of baptism and confirmation. A friend of mine, Dr. Ralph Martin, he's been involved in the renewal. He was one of the founder, founding pioneers of the charismatic renewal in the United States. He spent lots of time over in Rome talking with different bishops, cardinals, and, and he had audiences with popes. And one time he was driving in a, in a car in the back seat with Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul the Great. And John, St. John Paul was praying. And uh, Dr. Ralph Martin knew that St. John Paul the Great spoke many languages, but he could not determine what language he was praying in that particular moment as they were driving down the road, and he was just looking out at the window at people waving at him. He was praying, he was praying, he was praying. And he asked somebody else who was in the car, like, do you recognize the language that the Pope is using right now? And he goes, oh, he's praying in tongues. He does that a lot. 
This gift, all these gifts, all these charisms are poured out in abundance upon the church and are necessary for us to be the church. We only have to do what Mary and the saints have done and showed us the way, which is to say this yes in trust and belief and faith. Because like I said, every sacrament has two sides to it. There's God's side and there's our response. It's called opus operantum. That's God's part. That means that you can go to Mass with a priest who's in mortal sin. And because he prays the prayer in a valid and licit way, and he says the body of Christ and puts the host on your tongue or into your palm, you receive grace. God is there. He guarantees it. Whenever the sacrament, it doesn't matter who the priest is. It doesn't matter what church you're sitting in. If it's done validly and licitly, when you receive that sacrament, you receive grace. But the part on us is our response. That's the opus operantis. That's the heartfelt response of faith. You know, like I said, when we go to communion, it's not just saying, yes, this is the body of Christ. I'm saying yes to all of you as well. You realize that. When you go to Mass and you say, and the priest says, the body of Christ, it's this host, the body, blood, and soul of divinity. It's also to the body of church teachings because Christ is manifested in the truth of the church. It's saying yes to your neighbor because, because I'm one with Jesus and you're one with Jesus. Guess what? We're one. I don't get the option to pick and choose whether or not to, I get to love you. I'm commanded by my Lord and Savior to love you as I love myself. Nobody gets a pass from this. And this is only accomplished through the work of the Holy Spirit. The beauty of the Catholic Church is it's, it's, it's got a diversity of expression, a diversity of cultures that worship under the name Catholic. But when we come around the altar of God, that Holy Spirit makes us one. I've been at World Youth Days where I've been out in a field with people I don't speak, we don't speak the same language. I remember being in Madrid and seeing um, Pope Benedict, you know, leading adoration. And in that moment, it didn't matter what part of the country you were from, what your nationality was, what banner, flag, creed, color, whatever. We were one in Jesus Christ. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And we need to say yes to that. That is our, that is our part. You know, when I was 18 years old, I was on a retreat. And I went on this retreat because I was, my heart was being stirred to get to know God. I was getting ready to go off to college, and I knew that I was pretty much broken and didn't think I would survive my first year of college unless I got some sort of grounding in my life. And uh, God kind of had been working on, on me um, kind of like very um, subtly but uh, profoundly, uh, just moving my heart through different encounters I had with people, different things I was experiencing. Like I knew I needed more of God, but I, and I just was invited to come on this retreat. So I went. It was at a beautiful camp in northern Minnesota on a, on a beautiful lake. And I had to get there a day early because uh, the, the person who was going to give me a ride out to Minnesota from Michigan uh, had to get out there a day early. So I got there early, and the team that was putting on the retreat, um, they were driving up to this camp, and they said, oh, you can ride with us. You'll just be up there a day early. You can hang out and have fun. And, you know, you can go fishing. And there's like, as soon as I heard that you can go fishing, they had me. I'm, okay, I'm in. So we get up there. And I throw my stuff in one of the cabins, and I'm looking for the fishing gear. I'm going to go fishing. And one of the guys turns to me and says, oh, wait, before you go off, can you, you want to come pray with us? Now, listen, I, I didn't pray very well at that time. And so I wanted to say, no, I don't. I'm going to go fishing. But Catholic guilt is real. And I couldn't, couldn't say, well, I know we're about to start a retreat, but don't ask me to pray. <laughs> so I went and I prayed. And there was a circle of about 15 to 20 young adults. I, was, I had just graduated from high school, and they were all within two or three, maybe four years older than me. And somebody had a guitar, and they started strumming on the old guitar, this Jesus song. You know, and one of the charisms that I think a lot of Catholics cling to and hold on to is they learn how to sing without moving their lips. You go to your average Catholic church, that seems to be the predominant charism, Right. But these people were full-on engaged. They were like, hallelujah. I mean, like they were hitting all the notes and harmonizing. It was beautiful. And I'm like, I have never heard church singing like this. They really like to sing. Well, they got to the end of the song, and the guitar player kept playing. 
And the singing didn't stop. All of a sudden it was, hallelujah, I love you, Jesus. And they're shouting their praise to God. And I like, can feel like this discomfort welling up inside of me like these people are weird. I, I, I've crossed over into the twilight zone. This isn't even Catholic anymore. I'm like, I thought if I just slowly back up and into the bushes and run, I might be able to hitchhike home. And, you know, and I could feel all these defenses in me rising. And it even got worse because, um, you know, you know um, the person uh, next to me, I didn't know what was going on, but I thought they had just bought a car and made a bad decision because they were going like, I should have bought a Honda, I should have bought a Honda, I should have bought a Honda, I should have bought a Honda. I was like, whoa, ho, ho, ho. You know, and this other, another guy, he was like all proud of the, see my new bow tie, see my new bow tie. I was like, what in the world is that? I mean, like, I could just feel like, and it was like, if I was a thermometer, it kept rising and rising, and you know, you ever see the cartoon where the thermometer just kind of pops at the end? I felt like I was about to pop. And all I could do was, like, do this. <laughs> but then in a moment of grace, <laughs> in a moment of grace, I opened my eyes. And I looked across the circle. And there was just this beautiful young woman. I'd never met her before. But she was there with the big, this biggest smile on her face. You know, and I, I really appreciated what Chris said last night about some of you need to tell your face that you have joy. <laughs> because joy is what it's all about. But she just had this joy on her face, and she was just, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And that's all she was saying. And I remember, and, and, and that's when it was just like the piercing of the Lord's Spirit hit my heart and said, 18 years you've been alive, but you've never said that to me and meant it. And I just was convicted and I just said to the Lord, Lord, whatever it is that she has that gives her ability to love you like that, I want that. I want to have that kind of passion in my life. I want that kind of love in my life. I want that kind of joy in my life. And it wasn't at that moment that I was flooded with the Holy Spirit. Because I had also, you know, in, in my high school years, dabbled into drugs, drinking, lying, stealing, uh, looking at pornography, all the things that young people seem to get tripped up on, I had it. And I'd only been to confession twice in my life. My first confession, and then I, got con I went to confession right before I got confirmed. And both times, I just kind of mumbled my way through it without any intention of repenting, without any understanding that there was actual real grace and mercy there for me. It was just something I was told I had to go through. And so there was this blockage between me and the Lord that needed to be dealt with. Three nights later, they had a reconciliation service, right? I went to confession, and I confessed everything bawling, weeping and with just regret and, and sorrow before the Lord. At one point during the conf confession, the priest leaned forward to give me a hug, and his stole hit me in the face. And I thought he was offering me a handkerchief, so I grabbed it. <laughs> I, yes, I hawked a loogie on a priest's stolen confession. <laughs> True story. But when I was done confessing, he prayed the prayer of absolution. And it was like the classic ER scenario where the body's laying there lifeless and they put the paddles on it and go, Choo -choo, and the body just, whoa. And the person sits up and goes like, what the heck? You know, <laughs> that was me. God touched my life with such a powerful outpouring of grace. And then the Holy Spirit just flooded my life. And I mean, like, I heard God say, come follow me. And I remember saying to God, I'll do whatever you ask. I will never say no. You've proven to me your love is real. Your grace is real. I want more of this. Wherever you tell me to go, I'm going to go. And the next morning, Mark Burcham, who's the founder and president of Net Ministries, came up to me and said, God spoke to me last night. You're going to be a missionary on Net in the fall. And I'm like, I mean, every part of me, even after having such a dramatic encounter, was like, no way. I got a plan, and then the words of my own words echoing in my mind, wherever you tell me to go, God, I will go. And I stood in that vow, and I stood in that grace, and I said yes. And I started a career in ministry that has taken me to this point. There's not been a part of my life where I've not been active in some sort of evangelistic ministry in bringing people to a deep, deeper encounter with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because if you have something this great, you want everyone else to have it. 
and I can't imagine myself doing anything else. I love the Lord that much, and I've just been so blown away by his working in my life. And what did it start with? A simple yes, an openness, a desire. It's taken me years to get where I am. As much as I've pleased the Lord, I know I've disappointed him. There's times I wonder if he had given this kind of grace to somebody else, that somebody else might be much more saintly than I am. And I think about the times I've squandered the grace. But as soon as I get those thoughts in my head, I just lay them at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, your love is greater. My favorite saint is St. Therese of Lisieux, and she said, it's not that you take your sin so seriously or believe so, that your sin is so great, because your sin is great. <laughs> but God's love is greater. God's love and mercy is greater. Your sin is a drop of water in the palm of your hand. His mercy is the ocean. Throw that drop of water into the ocean of God's mercy and try to find it again. It's not there. You'll never find it. It disappears. It's absorbed. It's destroyed. It's, absor it's taken away by the ocean of God's mercy for you. And what he desires more than anything is to set your, on, your life on fire with the Holy Spirit so that you can understand the height, depth, width, and breadth, every part of God's love for you and be filled with all the grace you need for holiness and to serve him and to build up the church. That's what it's all about. And everything that the church has given us, from the sacraments to the scriptures to the, to the ch church's teachings on morality, all of it works together for our good. Let's pray. Let's just spend the rest of our time this afternoon praying. We're just going to pray. Come Holy Spirit. And, and, and before we say come Holy Spirit, what I, what I think I'd like to do is let's reverse the flow by first asking God to wash out all the... Is it still working? Okay, there we go. If you have something in your life that you think might be blocking God, a situation, a hurt, a pain, we're just going to take some time to just lay those things at the feet of Jesus and just push them out of the way so that God has clear and un unhindered access to our hearts so he can just pour love into us, okay? So let's empty ourselves so that we can be full. Let's let go of our pride. You know, Mary, the reason why the Holy Spirit was drawn into her womb was because of her humility. The Holy Spirit goes where there's humility. So as we humble ourselves before the Lord and just say, okay, Lord, I need you. I empty myself before you. I need your love because apart from you, what does God, Jesus say? Apart from me, you are nothing. God, I acknowledge my own nothingness apart from you. Come with your grace. Take my nothingness and make it something through the power of your Holy Spirit. So let's just pray. You don't have to stand at this point. Just get yourself comfortable where God can flow. Come Holy Spirit. And in your heart, we're going we're to sing a song. We're going to pray in our hearts. Let go. Just let go. Surrender. As the Spirit brings things to mind to let go of, just surrender it to Jesus. It could be your finances. could be a relationship. could be anything. Come, Holy Spirit. And here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Speak what is true. See, here's my heart. And here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart. Lord, speak what is true. Just speak what is true. Here's my life, Lord. Here's my life. Here's my life, Lord. Here's my life. Here's my life, Lord. Lord, I need you. Cause Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. You're my one defense. My righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Sing.
sing, Lord, I need you every hour. I need you. Bowing here, bowing here, I find my rest, I find my rest, and without you I fall apart, without you I fall apart, you're the one that guides, you're the one that guides my heart, and without you I fall apart, without you I fall apart. You're the one. You're the one that guides my heart. We sing, Lord, I need you. Because, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. You're my one. Defense my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Sing it from the heart. Cause Lord, I need you. Jesus, we need you. We empty ourselves before you. It's an act of your will taken in faith. Just empty yourself before God. Lord Jesus, I lay down my desires, my fears, my temptations, my doubts. I lay down the sin that still binds me, Lord. I lay down my desire to earn your love. I just want to trust in your love. lay down the efforts I've made to try to please you without you in control. Just take away my fears. Take away my anxieties. Lord Jesus, we lay it all before you at the foot of your cross. We empty ourselves. We renounce our possessions. Those things that we own but really own us. Lord Jesus, take all that. Our fears and worries about our finances. We renounce it all. We give you our will, our heart, our mind, our soul, our memory, our future, our past. We lay it all at your feet, Jesus. We empty ourselves completely before you now, knowing that in this emptiness, in this emptiness, you desire something great. A deeper outpouring of your Holy Spirit. So let's just ask now. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Pray with me. Please stand. Come Holy Spirit. Praise you Jesus. Come Holy Spirit. Praise your mighty name Jesus. Praise your mighty name Lord Jesus. Praise your mighty name Lord Jesus. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Speak out your desire to God. Ask Him for the gifts you need, the spirit of of, of courage, a spirit of love, a spirit of joy. Pour it out upon us, Lord. The wisdom that we need to know you, to serve you, to love you, the strength and grace to be holy. Pour it all upon us. Come, Holy Spirit. But most importantly, Holy Spirit, just give us you, yourself. Pour your life, the love of the Father, into our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit of God. We cry out. Lord Jesus, in our emptiness, fill us with new life, with your love. Come, Holy Spirit of God. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Praise your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Praise your mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Praise your mighty name. 
praise your mighty name. Praise you, Jesus. just not comfortable doing this and I just want to say God you're going to hate heaven because <laughs> we're going to be before the lamb on the throne praising him for eternity this is a foretaste of the joy this is like a, a drop on the tongue of the joy that's going to be ours in heaven and this is what it's all about every part of us animated by the spirit moving towards the father glorifying the son revealing the love of the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to do right now is I want to pray a prayer and I want you to repeat after me. It's a prayer just to open our hearts to God and ask Him to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Just giving Him final permission. And I want you to know something, that, that this is just the first of many times you're going to want to pray this. It's not a one-off experience. Just like you know, like, like the difference, one of the major differences between our, us and our Protestant brothers and sisters is they believe if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and make him the Lord of your life once, you're good. You're set. You're going to heaven. Whereas Catholics, we believe we need to do that every day. We wake up and we give our hearts to Jesus once again. So if you gave your heart to Jesus last night for the first time, give your heart to Jesus for the second time today, the third day third time tomorrow and on and on and in the same way if you're opening up your heart to the Holy Spirit right now for the first time you're going to do this a lot this is not a one and done this is the continual renewal that God wants to give us so let us pray in the name of the Father Son Holy Spirit and just repeat after me please Father as your child in Jesus 
I desire to be totally an instrument for your kingdom to manifest through my life. I desire to receive your promise of the Holy Spirit to those who believe. Jesus, my Savior and King, baptize me in the Holy Spirit so that the power of your resurrection will work in me so that I can be a faithful disciple. Transform me according to your will. Holy Spirit, empower me and fill me to overflowing. I hold nothing back from you. Work your gifts in me and through me, all of me, so that the Father's kingdom may be manifested in and through my life. I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Let's offer up some thanksgiving to God. And let's just continue to pray. This is an act of faith, but now the flow, like waves coming up on the beach. God just wants to send waves of grace throughout this chapel right now to wash over us, to renew us and strengthen us. Just open your arms, open your heart, allow the waves of grace to over, overflow as we praise and worship. Praise you, Jesus. Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. Praise, praise, praise your you. mighty name, Lord Jesus. Bless your holy name. Holy King is your name, O Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Praise your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Holy is your name, O Lord. I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, into hearts right now. I think right now God just wants to confirm his love upon each one of us. So just in your heart, say, Father, send me your love. Let me experience your love in a new way. Come, Holy Spirit, pour the love of the Father into our hearts right now. Let us know, not just with our minds that we're loved, but let us know in our hearts. Come with your peace, your joy. Come, Holy Spirit, we receive it all. Just thank you, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Praise you, Jesus. Glory. I see this, this glorious waterfall of grace just being poured out on us. A sparkling rainbow of, of beauty, sparkling like gems of God's grace being poured out on us. And as, as, as it reaches us, it just confirms that you are a beloved child of the Father, that you are loved. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your mighty name. Praise your mighty name. Praise your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Glory and honor and praise to you, Jesus. Come into my heart, Jesus, come.
This is just, oh man, I tell you, I remember my three-year-old daughter, she's now 20 and she's a sophomore here at the university. You, if, when you were checking in, if you had to get your housing assignment, you saw a girl with long blonde hair and, and, and glasses, that was my daughter, Catherine. And uh, when she was just a toddler, we went down to uh, the beach and uh, she, we climbed over the dune she was short, so she couldn't see it. But as soon as she saw the ocean, her eyes got as big as silver dollars, and she just started running and running and running. And she she got to the edge of the water, and her little toes got in the water, and she kept running. And the first wave came up and hit her hard and knocked her down. And she's like, I don't like the ocean. And I spent the next couple hours just walking on the beach with her and, and, and just getting her closer and getting her toes back in the water. Pretty soon she was up to her knees and pretty soon she was just loving it. And, and sometimes we come to the Lord and, you know, we, we don't know what to expect. And sometimes God knocks us over. Sometimes it's just this gentle washing. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is not about trying to have the most dramatic experience you can. It's about surrendering as much as you can and receiving as much as you can and letting God's life flow through you. When we pray tonight, I want you know I, I want you to be thinking because I, in my heart, here's what I know: we're all called to be missionary disciples. That each one of you is going to have a role in rebuilding and renewing the church that you've come from. But some of you are going to be given the gift of prophecy. Some of you are going to receive the gift of speaking in tongues. Some of you are going to get words of knowledge. You're going to be able to pray with somebody and read their heart and share with them exactly what they need to hear. Some of you are going to receive the gift of intercessory prayer. You're going to pray for people and God's going to answer your prayers in a particular way. Some of you are going to receive the gift of healing. Why? Because right now, God's gospel needs to be preached, not just in word, but in power. And he wants to equip those who are willing to say yes with the same gifts that he gave the, the apostles in the early church. Vatican II is a great thing. Do you know what Vatican I said? If you don't believe in miracles, you can be subject for uh, excommunication. Anathema. You don't believe in miracles? It's anathema. That's like the, the high, one of the most severe penalties you can get. Our, our salvation depends on our belief in the supernatural. I mean, what, what, are we, what are we looking at when we see a guy who rose from the dead? If that's how God redeemed how's he going to use us to cooperate in that redemptive work? Through other miraculous signs and wonders. Just be ready, be anticipating, be expectant, and be open to receive. But before we end, what I'd love for you to do is just spend a couple of minutes with one another. Get into groups of three. Whether you know the other two people or not, it doesn't matter because all you're going to do is you're just going to take a few seconds to lay hands on one another and say, Jesus Christ, bless this person. Seal the work that you've done in their hearts. The work of the Holy Spirit, seal it with your grace so that, it's, that, that Satan cannot snatch the seeds of faith. 
and the newness of life that you're, you're, you're putting into this person's heart. Keep them safe from the enemy. Keep them free from anxiety and continue to pour out their, your, your spirit on them for the rest of this weekend. As simple as that. Because not only do we receive the spirit of God, we've all been, as priest, prophet, and king in our baptism, given the ability to, to impart the spirit, to pray with others that they would receive it. You're not just a receptor of the Holy Spirit. You're going to be an instrument of the Holy Spirit to help spread the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to start practicing right now by just laying hands and praying over one another. This is like boot camp. So let's just spend the next few minutes. Just go ahead. John Paul will continue to play guitar. Just sit down, three of you in a little cluster. Pray amongst yourselves. It'd be like butter.
All right. I know a few of you are still praying, but I, I want to kind of, if I can, draw us back together. And if you need to, uh, if you want to finish up praying, you're more than welcome to stay in here and pray. Shh. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. This doesn't work for me. Because when you look at Chris, you're just like, you know, you can't look away. Um, yeah, so tonight, like I said, this is just the first phase, the first wave of the grace of your baptism in the Holy Spirit. There's many more waves to come. And tonight, I really, I can't express in my heart, I just know this is going to be an amazing night for everybody. And we're going to be so blessed. You know, we're going to have Father Dave uh, lead a, a healing service and a holy hour for us. When people, you know, talk about, you know, who've, who's helped you on your journey, um, you know, definitely Father Dave is one of those guys. We were uh, roommates here at Franciscan many years ago. And even back then, he was inspiring to me and made me want to be a holier guy. And nothing that he's done in his life has surprised me. And the fact that he's now our president is just what the Spirit's been preparing him for for the last 30 years. And, uh, but I know that more important than any title in front of his name or any position he might be offered is he desires to see the world set on fire for the Holy Spirit. And he is going to do an amazing job. And we just need to be lining up with where the Spirit takes us tonight. Amen. So you guys have a great dinner. Uh, if you want to stay here and pray a little bit longer, you're more than welcome to. We do have confessions starting at 5, so you probably will have to clear out probably around quarter or two so they can get the tape and everything set back up. Um, but we'll see you back in the field house in a little bit. Amen. Thank you all for coming. God bless you.